Good afternoon, ladies. My name is Cindy Rushing, and I have the pleasure of introducing a special guest today, Claire Luce Abbey. Claire is our Luce board member. She is the granddaughter of Henry Luce, the founder of Time Incorporated, and the namesake of his beautiful and accomplished wife, Claire Booth Luce. Claire Abbey was born, raised, and educated in the East Coast, and she moved to San Francisco in 1981. Claire worked as a photojournalist and then produced a food and wine television show. She enjoyed a close personal relationship with her grandmother, Claire Booth Luce, that involved extensive travel together during the last nine years of Mrs. Luce's life. Claire and her late husband, Cliff Abbey, designed and manufactured clothing lines in San Francisco prior to their move to Napa Valley where they realized their dream of producing world-class wines. Tying her past to the present, the emblem on their wine label pays homage to the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the award that was bestowed upon her grandmother, Claire Booth Luce, by President Reagan in 1983. Please join me in welcoming our friend and esteemed board member, Claire Luce Abbey. Leak. Well, it is a pleasure to be here, and um, I must say, you all impress me immensely. And I know that if my grandmother were here today, she would want to speak to each and every one of you for hours. So, I had the great privilege of a close and personal relationship with my brilliant, beautiful namesake. We traveled the globe and spent countless hours discussing a vast array of subjects, everything from scuba diving to diplomacy. She truly lived up to William F. Buckley's famous quote, there is no subject on which Claire Booth Luce cannot illuminate. When Michelle Easton asked me to speak to you today, my first thought was, what would Claire say to a room full of college women if she were alive today? And then I thought, good heavens, what would Claire think about the world today? It's hard to imagine how she would react to American life in 2015. iPhones, the internet, social media, driverless cars, and EGADs, the Kardashians. <laughs> Actually, she would no doubt have something priceless and probably quite unprintable to say about the Kardashians. But I digress. Certainly it would not be lost on her what a daunting task it is for young women of a conservative mindset to navigate the college environment of today. While you have many more opportunities, you are up against an increasing liberal faculty, a campus-wide substandard on social values, and a leftist media that will stop at nothing to control the narrative. A university's obligation is not to teach what students what to think, but to teach students how to think. I recently learned that in the 2012 presidential race, according to Federal Election Commission data, 96% of all campaign contributions from the Ivy League, faculty and employees, went to Barack Obama. 96%. When 96% of Ivy League donors support one candidate over another, you have to wonder whether students are being exposed to a diversity of views that college environment should offer. There is no diversity on a, on a university campus if the faculty is politically homogenous. To quote Michael Bloomberg in his 2014 commencement speech to Harvard University, he said, Great universities must not become predictably partisan, and a liberal arts education must not be an education in the art of liberalism. But how can you, be effect, how can you not be affected by this constant stream of liberal influences? It's only natural to want to fit in, go with the flow, be like everybody else. But when your values are assaulted and your core beliefs belittled, you have to find the courage to go against popular convention. Claire Booth Luce once said, courage is the ladder upon which all other virtues mount. 
Of all the words that can be used to describe Claire, courage is the one that portrays her character best of all. It took courage for her to divorce her aristocratic, abusive husband at a time when society scorned divorce. It took courage to pursue a job in publishing. It took courage to write a play that parodied the very society that sat in the audience. It took courage to be a World War II war correspondent. It took courage to criticize the wartime policies of the Roosevelt administration. It took courage to warn against the rise of international communism following World War II. It took courage to give the keynote address at the 1944 Republican National Convention. It took courage to accept the diplomatic post to Italy and courage to relinquish the diplomatic post to Brazil. It took courage to sponsor anti-Castro groups. Remember, these accomplishments predated the modern women's liberation movement. Claire once said, because I am a woman, I must make unusual efforts to succeed. If I fail, no one will say she doesn't have what it takes. They will say women don't have what it takes. Do you feel that way today? She made that pronouncement over 70 years ago. The reality is that no one lumps all women together like they once did because there is inevitably one or more who don't fit the mold. They break out and stand alone. Women today have a genuine sisterhood in all walks of life. She was not, that, such was not the case in Claire's day. She was one of the first to challenge the social standards of the day and go, in most cases, where no woman had gone before. You are living in interesting times. You are currently witnessing one of the first presidential races with two viable women candidates. As I watch the debates and listen to the media breakdown, I think about how Claire would interpret the theatrics. She would be quick to question the media-supported war on women, as she would be the first to tell you women have come a long way. While there is still plenty of work to do, especially in the area of equal pay, creating a gender issue when women are making broad strides in every walk of life is disingenuous at best. It is insulting to present this phony war as real. It assumes that the vast majority of women are too stupid not to recognize that they are being completely manipulated into believing that such a war exists. Claire and I often discussed where the women's liberation movement failed. Don't get me wrong, Claire was a big supporter of equal rights, but she fervently believed that a woman needn't lose her femininity to achieve it. Why, she would ask, must all decent social mores be scrapped for such a simple and practical idea? There is a difference between the sexes. Why do those differences have to be dumbed down to e to, for either side to evolve? What is wrong with wanting men to be masculine and women to be feminine in the most basic of terms? During the height of the women's movement, men were scorned for opening a woman's door and the like. Seemingly, equality meant never to show respect or common courtesy. It sounds crazy, I know, but it's how it was. You are still up against plenty of political correctness, correct nonsense, but at least now beauty doesn't cancel out brains or vice versa. So whether you want to be a wife and mother, or the President of the United States, or both, thanks to women like Claire Booth Luce, who challenged the social convention of her day, there's nothing in your way. If she were here today, she would encourage you to pursue your dreams and never forget to thine own self be true. An American president has to be a strong and credible presence on the world stage. Of the two women in the race, who is truly presidential material? While she struggles in the polls, and she may not have the Clinton political machine and the media in her back pocket, Carly Fiorina may just have what it takes. If nothing else, she raises the bar and creates a necessary contrast to Hillary Clinton. Carly has, in fact, worked her way up the corporate ladder and conquered the, the boardroom. And believe me, like Claire Booth Luce, she didn't do it with the shrill, scheming, hostile methods that re represent Mrs. Clinton's 
professional career. The most striking contrast from my point of view between Hillary and, and Carly is motive. Hillary is the most power-hungry, money-grubbing politician to ever come down the pike. Virtually every decision she has made while, while she made while Secretary of State benefited the Clinton Foundation. And while her most important platform is this ginned up war on women, she clearly has no problem taking money from countries known for their abuse of women. Carly is not a career politician, but she has a command of the issues, both domestic and international. She has fought the good fight in the corporate arena, and she can take those skills onto the world stage. And frankly, she will do it with a style and class that has so far eluded Hillary Clinton. In the end, it simply comes down to who is the best candidate. Whose character do we trust? That word is supremely important in this race. We should vote for the most qualified and capable person, male or female. When I was a teenager, my friends would often marvel at my desire to spend time with my grandmother. Obviously, Claire was not the kind of grandmother who was sending me home-baked cookies in boarding school. And given her controversial notoriety, it wasn't always easy having the same name. Nevertheless, our relationship taught me to appreciate my elders, and I encouraged my friends to do the same. If your grandparents are still alive today, I urge you to talk to them about their lives and their experiences and how they view the world today. You will learn so much about them, and it will give you a far better perspective and a far greater appreciation for the world around you. Claire Booth Luce defied convention and followed her core beliefs throughout her storied career. She wasn't just book smart. She had common sense and a keen intuition. Let me repeat that. Common sense and intuition. She learned at an early age to listen and to seek out those for whom she could from whom she could learn. Having a mentor is so important at this stage of your life. If she were here today before you, I am sure she would encourage you to find a mentor and listen carefully to their worldview. She would also encourage you to broaden your horizons whenever possible, and most of all, become an interesting person. You have any number of opportunities to experience the world around you. Look, listen, learn. Become that person in the room that everyone wants to talk to. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Arissa and I'm a sophomore at Yale. I just wanted to ask what some of your fit or one of your favorite little known stories about your grandmother would be since there are many like her time in Italy and her time as a um, at Vanity Fair are more well known. Uh, well, let's see. Well, because of Vanity Fair, she met my grandfather and um, that was not a very, um, shall we say, auspicious beginning in that um, her role at the time at Vanity Fair was to write captions under photographs, and uh, they were doing a story on Henry Luce, and she was sent over to his office, and um, he didn't treat her very well. He was, uh, he was one of those men who was constantly looking at his watch and didn't, you know, didn't have any capacity for small talk. <laughs> and so she was sort of put off by that and promptly wrote something less than um, flattering under his picture. And uh, he, of course, saw it and rang up Condé Nast, and I think he actually even probably tried to have her fired. Um, and uh, so what actually ensued was uh, nothing happened to her job, but uh, she realized he was rather angry with her. And uh, they happened to be at the Waldorf at the same gathering, some evening you know, ball of some sort, and she saw him crossing the, uh, the, dine, the, the dance floor before the dancing and started with two glasses of champagne and she intercepted him, 
took one of the glasses out of his hand as if she, you know, was assuming that they were for her, was for her, which she knew perfectly well it wasn't. And uh, she apologized, and they off, went off into a corner and started talking, and he suddenly realized what this woman was really all about, and that really was the beginning of their, of their great love story. Um, Italy, do you want me to mention Italy or no? Okay, uh, well, you all know that she was given this rather unique post for a woman of the day, anyway, uh, to be ambassador to Italy, and uh, it was not well received, by the way, uh, by the Italians at first, um, so she had a bit of an uphill battle there. Um, but, and while she was there, she, um, she, she worked very hard, and she did, in fact, win over the Italians. To, the day, to this day, if I meet an old enough person who knew her, uh, or who remember, remembered her, uh, they always speak very lovingly. It's, it's quite something. It's very gratifying for me to travel around Italy. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, when she was there, however, uh, she was, would always take her tea and her work into her study, and um, she became very sick, and they sent her back to Washington, and, and uh, they discovered she had arsenic in her blood, and they thought the Italians were trying to poison her. So it was an international scandal for a short time until they realized that the arsenic was coming from old lead paint from the ceiling of her, of her room uh, at, the, uh, at the embassy. So it was not an international, they weren't trying to kill her. So anyway, it was a unique sort of moment in time. Hi, uh, my name is Emma Battle. I'm from Salem College in North Carolina. Um, first, I wanted to say I appreciate what you said about getting to know your grandparents. My uh, grandmother was 95 when she died two years ago, and I miss that those times every day. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, obviously you talked about how your grandmother was a, a woman ahead of her time, and she was always looking towards the future. Can you tell us what Claire Booth Luce would have said to us as we are the future of the female conservative movement? Well, as I said in, earlier, um, you know, you really do have to hang on to your core beliefs and, and not allow all of this noise around you, which I think you all, because you're here, tells me right away that you're, you're already ahead of the game. Um, but she, she, would, she would say, if you had a mentor, if you, could, if you don't have one, you should find one because it's the people who have been on this planet longer than you have that really genuinely have a lot more experience and have lived through the times that, that you hear about and read about and are always being rewritten, thank you very much, uh, by the media, that, um, that if you have those people with real life experiences to lean on, uh, you, will, you will certainly you could go farther, I think. And I know she would definitely say that. She realized, fortunately for me, she realized that, that she had become my mentor. I was very lucky on that, in that respect. Um, and I also think that you, you have to be comforted by the idea that if you have, you have a good argument and you can hang on to that argument, that you can even face a, a, a professor who disagrees with you. Having a name like mine, you can imagine what it was like. You know, as soon as a man, a professor saw my name, I would be singled out almost every time a political remark was made. You know, and you don't want to do that. When you're, you're a college kid, you kind of want to just blend in and be a part of the scene or whatever to a point. And uh, if that's going to happen to you, if, or if, if you're known, your, your opinions are known, uh, that, are, that, oppose, that are opposing, get good at your argument and stick to it. She would certainly say that to you. Hello, my name is Jennifer Mayorga, and I just had a question about um, the value of studying past conservative leaders, and especially um, conservative women leaders, and if you have any, any other names or people we should kind of do some research or some reading um, that could continue to inspire us and their courage and their boldness to be conservative leaders um, in a time when, you know, women were not always heard. Um, so yeah, if you have any well, actually, ideas. Well, actually, the, the book that you all have been given is was a brilliant choice, by the way. Margaret Thatcher, it was, is, you know, having lived much more in the modern time. I mean, I think when you go back too far, um, it becomes much more of a, an emotional struggle. Claire managed to span a fair amount of time in a lot of different professions. So she, was, she had a unique voice. Um, I can't off the top of my head think of a, of a particular book title, but I bet Marlene does. <laughs> I do. Uh, one you really need to know is named Mercy Otis Warren. 
Mercy Otis Warren was the most remarkable woman of the American Revolution. Oh, right, she right. was more famous in her day than Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and Dolly Madison combined. But she was removed from the history books in the 1830s because, folks, she wasn't politically correct. Right. She was the first American author to write a major work. It's called History of the Rise, Progress, and Termination of the American Revolution. And I actually reenact her as part of a four colonial ladies in costume. Altogether, I have her as one of the four, the ending, the finale of that. And then I also do her independently. She knew every uh, major player during the time of the American Revolution. She had most of them in her home. And Thomas Jefferson, Samuel Adams, John Adams, John Dickinson, and a few other names you might recognize, all wrote to her asking her political opinion, not things about what you would normally think they would talk to a woman about. OK? Yeah, Claire was a little bit like that, too. She was usually the only woman in the room of men. All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing some stories there, Claire. We really appreciate it. You're very welcome.